doing something, for those of you who are not electrical engineers, don't worry. It doesn't matter whether you understand what I'm saying. What you want to watch is the method by which I'm doing the solving the problem. Okay? I want you to watch my, the, 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 the structure of this, what I do. Okay? So I say, oh yes, uh, this is a uh, probably a little ready amplifier from my low fidelity high fi system. And um, these transistors are all active linear region transistors, whatever that means. What that means, I'll just say it very quickly. A transistor is a, is a little valve okay, that has a mouth that opens up like this. If I open the voltage here, then the current is allowed to flow. How's that? Okay, and that, that's the amount of the voltage up in there. 26 volts, and then it turns on. Think of it that way. So I say, oh my, uh, DC bias analysis. Uh, this that means the capacitors are open circuits. Uh, this is a voltage divider. I know the voltage here at the top at the, on the rail, and I know the voltage here, and therefore I know the voltage here by the voltage divider formula, and therefore I know the voltage divider here is 0.6 volts below that. Therefore, I know the voltage here is 0.6 volts below that, so it's 1.2 volts. And I know that the voltage from here to here is that it, it, I now know what it is. Okay, so that since I know this resistance, I know the current through here. That current must be coming this way because it can't go in the base of the model I'm thinking. Uh, and then I can't be going this way and it can't be going this way because those eventually get to the in bases. So it must be going through this resistor. So I have to know the voltage, the potential here, and I know the potential here, so I know the and I have the current through here, so I know the voltage here, okay? and therefore I know the voltage is 0.6 volts below here, and now I see this is two resistors in series, so I know the voltage, I know, therefore I know the current, therefore I know the current coming through here, therefore I know the voltage here, therefore I know the voltage here, and therefore I know the current through here, and I know all the DC parameters. Okay? Now, given those DC, now I have to check this, of course, because it may be that the actual amount of current flowing through here might be enough to change the real voltage of the <coughs> divider, but that's a check. It may not matter. Okay, in fact, this is a, a, the current through here is talking about about 100. You get another 100, so 10,000. You get a, a current coming out of there. So it won't matter very much. Okay, that's a, that's a DC bias concept. Tell you the gain of this thing. Sure, if I go twitch, this is a, now a short circuit. This is a short circuit. I go twitch on this. I have a voltage. This my voltage goes the same amount. This goes the same amount. This goes up a little bit, the same amount. Therefore, I know the increase in the, in the current through here. I know the increase in the current through here. Therefore, I know the decrease in this voltage is the ratio of this resistor to this resistor. Okay, so I know the gain of this stage. Okay? It's the ratio of is those two. Then, I, the similar thing happens here, but I often, since this is incrementally shorted, then I know, I know it's the ratio of this resistance to this resistance. So the total gain of this amplifier is RC2 over RE2B uh, times RC1 over RE1. Okay? That's what an expert does. There's nothing, no equations. Now, if you watch what I did, you see I'm looking through the thing as a little tube. And I'm saying making local deductions when possible. And I can't solve everything. Sometimes I have to introduce a variable. Maybe I'll get an equation someday. Okay, but I'm going to try my damnedest not to. Okay, now I'm going to make use of the simplest model possible, but I told you is probably accurate to within a few percent. Then I can reuse that to refine. I can add, add new effects. I can tell you there's paroxytic elements involved here. The transistor isn't exactly what I said it is. Okay, and then I'll, that'll refine it. I can use that as a starting point for understanding what's going on. Okay, now, I want you to understand that very well. So, I, what I did is I started writing a program to do what I did, or actually what Paul Penfield did. And then I hired Richard Stallman. You don't know who Richard Stallman is. Right? They had a founder of the, the Free Software Foundation. He was an undergraduate, he was an undergraduate at Harvard at the time. And he worked with me on the, he did the algebra part of the program okay, for doing, doing this stuff. And it was pretty successful. That is, this program is only, in those days it was pretty bad because we weren't good programs. Meaning, I've learned a lot of programming since 1975, so I can make it a lot clever. But the program is a few pages long. It can answer questions like, why do you believe the current is what it is? And it gives you a little proof. Okay? Things like that. But, the, but what is it, that, what is it that, that was really interesting here was the program was readable. I could give it to somebody who didn't know how to do this. They could read that program and understand it, and then they could do the things I just did. As the program linguistically, if written well, was something I could use to transmit information from person to person, not from person to computer. That was only the incidental part. Okay? So 
that's a very, that's, that's the first step in understanding what I really want to talk about today. Now, now, the old days, the bad old days, we used to write code that looks like this. This is Fortran, for those of you who've never seen any Fortran. <coughs> C is not much better. Um, this is well-written Fortran. This is a, this is a uh, it's sort of a terrible program. I wrote it one time because I was working with some physicists who didn't know any other language. But <coughs> uh, this is part of a much bigger system, which I'm not showing you, which integrated the motions of stars in a... In a in a galactic cluster, and it was using a leapfrog integrator, which says, I know the velocity now, and I know the position here, so I go leapfrog. Now that I know the new position, I can do the new forces, and I can leave the velocity, and so on. Okay? That sort of thing. So it's a, it's a symplectic second order integrator. Not very interesting. Okay? But the worst of this is that the forces are computed here, and by side effect, they change the accelerations. Okay? It doesn't, it, there's nothing here that says the velocities are independent. Because I didn't tell you where this, how those forces are computed. It's done by, by, by some under the table communications trick. Okay? And here the, uh, the time step is computed, and that's being used to get the next time step, and so on, um, and things like that. So there's implicitness going on there. Also, the three dimensionality of the space is built into this picture. Okay? Now, that, that in itself is a problem. I mean, I have three, three spatial dimensions, but I can't use this for anything else. Okay, now I'm going to show you a pretty program. It's very different. The program, uh, I suppose about, what is it, 1980s, uh, I was uh, involved in writing the, making the world's fastest numerical integrator for the motions of the planets. Okay, and that's because we were doing some, I was doing research with Jack Wisdom on, uh, on chaos in the solar system. It was great, great fun. But one of the, what we did show that the solar system was chaotic. But that's not the interesting thing right now. What I'm going to show you is, first of all, how do you compute the forces between things? Well, you all know this, but so it's not worth, not worth going into detail, so I'll try the answer now. Okay, so here I've got two particles, P1 and P2, and I've got an acceleration, so there's, a, there's an acceleration of, uh, of part particle 1, A1. The acceleration of particle 1 is, what, minus G, M2 times P2 minus P1 is vectors over, is in Newtonian gravity, <coughs> P1 minus P2 cubed. Right? Because it's an inverse square law. And I've got, this is only the direction of the force. And the, the rate, in other words, this, the, the, this, this vector <coughs> divided by its absolute value is a unit vector in the right direction. Okay? And a1, a2, is, the, is also a similar thing, but it's plus g m2 times p2 minus p1 over p1 minus p2. Doesn't matter it's which one it's in, because I'm taking the absolute value, the length. Okay, so that's right. Okay, well, let me show you how to compute, first of all, the force law. Force law is very simple. There it is. Gravitation a part of the, between particle P1 and P2. And I get myself, this is in a funny language which has lots of parentheses. If you don't like parentheses, it's fine. Okay. So it's my favorite language. Okay. Uh, but basically, it's saying, let, DX, let the, different, the, the dx vector be the difference in these two positions. Our q be the q would be the norm of that. Uh, then uh, this, this other g times dx over our q would be am minus 1 times the s. But this readable, first of all. That's, and this is producing both accelerations for both particles. Now, doing some work, unpleasant work, I have to be able to make, turn this into something for any number of bodies, for n bodies. Okay, boom, that's easy. I'm not going to read you the code. It's, this is the thing that makes, that, that makes the accelerations from a force, a force law, if I start the force law, I get the accelerations for all for a lot of bodies. Okay, that's what's going on in here. And you don't want to know the details, but it turns out it's rather easy to write. This is uh, nothing under the table. That's the nice thing. Well, everything's being carried, in this case, by, by value. There's no there are no assignments occurring here. Doesn't mean I don't like assignments, but I don't. But that's what I mean. But I'm willing to use them when I need them. Here I don't need them. Okay? So then, another thing here is, well, okay, there's a thing called the system derivative. I want to make, I want to be able to do numerical integration. What numerical integration is going to want to do is the following. And what I want to say, yes, 
I have a box, and it has here um, a, a state going in, the state of the system, which is going to have things like the uh, time, the position, let's call it, the acceleration, no, the, the velocity. Okay? But I want to cut these, these are not vectors, these are the, the set of all the, the, the positions and velocity components of all the particles in the system. That's going in there. What's coming out is the derivative of time with respect to itself, one. Right? What comes out of here is the velocities. So that's just a connection that goes across. You notice I'm an engineer, I built diagrams. And then what comes out of here is the acceleration, which is the derivative of the velocity. Okay? And that means I'm going to combine together, they say, the positions and the velocity in the most general case. So I've got something in here which goes like this, and maybe the time may go in if it turns out it's a time varying system, and that goes out like that. Okay? <coughs> so that's the, this, is, this box is then going to be connected to something which does intervals. Three of them. If I've got, because what's going is the, Acceleration is going to come out, come out over here, and turn into velocities. The velocities are going to come around here to turn into positions. There's initial conditions here. Initial conditions are being set up. And the one is being integrated, getting the increment of time. Here's the state bus, and here's the differential state bus. Okay, and you see what's happening. That's, a, that's how you think about these things. And by golly, if I built an electrical circuit that would do it, it would do it this way. Okay? So thinking, well, that's what you're seeing here is the thing that makes, that, that, that does this thing that makes up, I've given a, a set of particles, the system state, it's going to make a new system state, which is the differential state. So it's going from here to here, there's a system derivative, goes from there and there, making a bunch of particles, and over there, the, the, uh, the uh, acceleration is being computed. Okay? Because what's happening is the velocities and the accelerations are being put in each of the particles. Now, now it's very simple. Now the integrator is nothing in particular. The integral just makes a stream of results. Okay? A stream of results which, are, which is given an initial state and a, an initial time step for the integrator. The integrator may have to choose what time step he really wants to do, but you know, often you want to plot in particular steps. So you put in your h over here, you make a, you make a stepper, which then, which then you're building up a stream of states, and out comes the, the, the stream. And that's all, again, still completely functional if you want. Doesn't mean I'm advocating functional programming. I mean, so I, I'm, I'm not. But this is an example okay, of a clean program, an easy one where nothing is under the table. And you can learn from it by, by reading the program. And finally, if I have a more complicated integrator than, say, um, than, say what you just saw, uh, a leapfrog, well, maybe run should cut it. There's a run cut integrator. I could have replaced this with a quality control bunch cutter, which knows how to set, choose, choose its own step size, give it a suggestion, which is what that is. You can fill out a lot of the, the intermediate steps if necessary. But this is just to say, those are all nice modular systems that can be plug, plugged in one after another, and they, they are all transparent and easily understood. So this is something a person can read and understand. And that's part of the part of the story here. <clears throat> now, so, but you see, the, right now I'm just talking about communicating method. <coughs> One thing I'm going to worry about now is how it actually clarifies meaning. Most of the time you think of, oh yes, that's how you do something. But meaning is much harder. So let me start with the, of course, the reason why this all works is because of wonderful stuff going on inside, inside lists that I'm not going to tell you about. Okay, but we'll worry about that some other time. But, what, what's, how do I communicate meaning? Here's something that you encounter in an advanced mechanics class, which I teach. This is this, the oil and Lagrange equations. And as written, they are meaningless. And I'll explain that in a, very, in a, in a short time. Let me erase this again. <clears throat> Now, this is a great invention. Great invention at the beginning of sort of the, um, the, 18th, the 19th century. <coughs> right, the 19th century. Uh, there were people like, like Lagrange who were figuring out how to actually take Newton's equations and make them clear in 
much more general context. How you actually how you actually do things like efficiently compute the motions of planets. How do you deal with things that have constraint factors in them like this, or, or a pendulum like this, without trying to even you have to realize, of course, this is 10 to the 23rd little particles bound together with strong forces. And, and if you try to do that by Newton's method, you have no idea what's going on. Okay, but in fact, you can you transform this into an easier into an easier task by using a method that comes from what's called uh, variational calculus. And what's go, what happens is that by some very clever methods, I throw a chalk at people who sleep. By very clever methods, uh, it turns out that you can write down just a very, uh, very a scalar value function of things like the time, the velocity, the position, and the velocity. And you end up with a, uh, a, a thing that then you take derivatives of to give you the equations in motion. That's what this trick is. And it's your job as a, as a scientist to figure out what the Lagrangian is, because that's the thing, the Lagrangian is function L. The Lagrangian is that you in fact describe your system so you can do this. And it's, there are some fairly simple rules for simple systems, but it gets very, you can do many things. You can't deal with things like friction, but you can show things that have to do with the, the symmetries of the universe all of a sudden appear. Very clear ideas. Okay? So that's, this, is a, this is a nice idea, but it has a problem. Uh, I'll show you what the problem is. The problem is because everybody <coughs> thinks they know what this means. Boom. I mean, how did you actually make up the equations of motion? Well, what you normally do is somebody somebody gives you a Lagrangian. Here's a Lagrangian for a general uh, a general uh, potential uh, a, a system with a potential energy that's determined only by the positions of the particles. Okay? So it says it's the, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. This is the Hamilton's method of doing this. Okay? And so what you do is you start out with this thing, you start computing the pieces of that equation that you saw over here. I have to compute the partial derivative with help with respect to q dot. Well, q dot is here to x dot. Okay, so uh, the partial derivative of that is certainly mx. And I have to go get this partial derivative over here, and that's uh, uh, minus dv dx, which remember that's the force. Right? If, you have, how, if I move a little particle, then how much force it, 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 it feels is a partial derivative of the potential energy change as you move. Okay? And then um, x and x dot are independent variables. That's what makes it possible to be these partial derivatives. But by golly, x dot happens to be d, dx by dt, the derivative of x uh, of the position. And x double dot is the second derivative of that. Okay? So we can do this. Now we can write down from here this derivative. Okay? That one is the derivative of this is mx double dot, so we get an equation of motion like that. All very simple. Huh? These are independent, but now I can connect them. I can compute one from the other. Bullshit. <laughs> Somebody has pulled a fast one. He has. This is, in fact, fallacious, but done every day, and gets the right answer. <laughs> it is often the case in <coughs> physics that you're taught fallacious ways to get right answers. <laughs> why it works, I can't say. But I can say why I can buy and make it so it's clear what's going on. So that, in fact, we can remove the fallacy. Okay. Here, what's the, what, what is LeBron's equation trying to tell us? You go back here, it's, a, it's an equation, it's a differential equation. It's an equation that's a different equation's job is to test a possible path to see whether it's acceptable. If you substitute in the, 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 the acceleration in that path at every point, and here the, the partial derivative of the potential at every point uh, with, uh, for, for, that, for that path, then the, this would be balanced. That's what it means. Where's the path? The problem is the path doesn't even appear in this equation. What's worse is, that L is a function of three variables, time, position, and velocity. So I can take partial derivatives with respect to velocity and position, all right, okay? But then I reach what I get back is a fu function of three, derivatives, three, three, three variables. When I take this, this derivative, that derivative, I'm only taking derivative of what? I guess I'm not taking derivative partial derivative with respect to time. That's not what's happening. What's happening is I'm assuming that the path has now been substituted in, 
And I take the derivative with respect to the time of the path, they get a derivative of one argument, function of one argument. So this is, in fact, a type violation from a computer science point of view. Right? You know, and you wouldn't know that until you start running the program. Okay? It smokes. Right? The program is not going to work. Let's look at this more clearly. What is what it really means? This is what someone would write if they were being careful. Right? Now, we can ask the question of why people are not careful, especially when they teach classes which I think is enorm enormously annoying. But here, what this is, I've got a function of three variables. I take a partial derivative. That makes sense. I can then substitute a path, w, for q. And I can take a path and substitute uh, a derivative of that path, the time derivative of that path, for q dot, in this function. Now I can take a derivative of this because I've got something uh, legitimate. Then similarly, I can do the same thing over here, but I don't have to take the derivative. So this is the actual correct Lagrange equations. But you know, this is about introducing all sorts of intermediate weirdness and all that stuff that nobody's going to see. Why can't we just use the functions to begin with? The functions themselves are the right thing. And they have no, they have no confusion. We're dealing with expressions too much. Right? Remember, when I write a program that computes the parallel resistance of two resistors, I can write it as 1 over 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. I could also write it as R1, R2 over R1 plus R2, and those are the same thing. The function is the same, right? but the expression is different. So the expression doesn't carry as much, as much semantic content as the function. Let's go and look at the function. Boom. We can transform this into functions. Okay? Here we go. I'm going to say here, this is the derivative with respect to 0, 1, 2, the second argument. Okay? Now, what I mean by this, this derivative, the derivative of L, is the derivative of L with respect to its, its I'm sorry I'm using zero base indexing. Its third argument is the one indexed by 2. Okay? Well, that's just the way things are. Okay? You can write which or whatever. But the, the point is that the point is this is a well-defined thing because of a property of a function of, of three arguments. And then I'm going to apply that result to these three arguments. Okay. I can take a derivative with respect to time of that, that's fine. And so now I can do the same thing over here. Okay. Let's define this object to be the extended path. It's a, this is a special function of the, or operator if you want to call it, of the path function which gives me, the, gives me a function of time. So this is, a, this is a, a, a tuple of three objects. Now, <clears throat> so now I can rewrite this this way, okay? like that. Now I'm also going to realize that why do, I, why do I have to care about this time variable at all? T. It's just something that's inside there. But what I really want to do is say that this is the composition of two functions. Okay? This one over here is a composition of two functions. And I want to take the derivative of the composition. So why do I deal with the functional derivative instead of the, instead of the expression derivative? Okay? I, why introduce this x? Okay, it doesn't matter. This is always, this is df at time t is d, d with respect to x, and that applies to <coughs> where x equals t. Okay? To be perfectly honest, that's the word, really honest thing with this. And now I can write you something which is no longer or shorter than the original Lagrange equations, but which has no bull in it. It's telling you exactly what you're doing. Okay, so that means I can tell the computer about it. Okay? And the computer now knows what I taught it. And not only that, if I gave you that program, or at least a good notation, then it's the case that you would know it too. But you wouldn't have realized that you had to do that unless you had to program. And it's not clear that in fact you're being, you're being confused. And so this is one of the things that I can just give an example of how pretty a result you get, which is computable now based on having a better this notation, which by the way is not my notation. This notation is the notation used by Michael Spivak in his book Calculus on, uh, on Manifolds. It's a 
It's a modern notation in mathematics, not using Leibniz notation. And once I can use that notation, then that's a one-to-one -one correspondence with the pretty program. So that's it. That's to give you an idea of how to clarify meaning. But you might have said, well, I don't really care. After all, I can get the answer. That's, of course, what the, the old physicist would tell us. Judgment of the right? But the real thing here is I really do want to understand. And therefore, I really want to see what's going on here. <clears throat> now I'd like to show you some poetry. There's some of the most beautiful stuff ever, ever invented. And here's... <laughs> this is Mr. Maxwell's equation for, for electromagnetic radiation in free space with charges <coughs> and currents. This is telling us a story. One thing, again, that bothers me about the way we teach engineering, physics, mathematics, things like that, is we don't think about it as being literature. And you have to learn how to read. And one of the other things that happens is, this is a language. This, this says something to you. Each of those is a sentence of a language. It may be foreign, but you have to learn, you know, when you learn something like French, you probably shouldn't start reading the grammar. You know, and mathematical notation is notoriously terrible. Um, cosine square x is cosine x times cosine x. Right? Everybody agree? Right? What's cosine minus 1x? <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly not 1 over cosine x. Now, do we expect high school students to actually understand this? They're too logical. There's something wrong. <laughs> Now, we might speculate why mathematicians and, and, and physicists and people like that speak this terrible, crooky language, you know, where they write these things that have ambiguous and complicated meanings. And the answer is real. When I'm talking to you now, I'm not speaking in perfect sentences. I'm, when I'm trying to tell you, if I were trying to tell you some story, it would have to be very, very ambiguous, most of the words I use. And the reason why it works at all is because we're almost identical. Almost all humans are the same, you know, except the broken ones, <laughs> you know, the broken ones, and maybe the occasional, the occasional Mozart or Einstein. But the, the, the fact is people are almost the same. And as a consequence, we've had almost the same, we're biologically almost identical, and furthermore, we've had almost the same actual experiences. And so there's a data structure in your mind which is all, everything you know and all that. And there's some data structure in my mind that's similar. And if I, if I, um, Try to communicate some tiny piece of that data structure to you, I only have to produce a few bits. And the, the fact that we're almost identical automatically disambiguates it. So that's, a, that's a, a reason why it works at all. But in any case, this is beautiful. What this is saying is that, well, electrical, uh, electric fields can emanate from charges. That's what you see up there. You see that magnetic fields don't, don't uh, have any sources. But in fact, uh, if, I have a, if I have circulation in a magnetic field, it can come from either a changing electric field or some current. And a circulation in an electric field comes from a changing magnetic field. Before Maxwell, everything here was new <coughs> except this current was missing. That's called the displacement <coughs> current term. And what happened was that Faraday and, 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 and Ampere and people like that all figured this out. And they, were, they did that by experiments, and they were very smart. And in fact, Faraday was one of the most impressive characters of all time. He didn't know any mathematics. In fact, Maxwell writes in his book that he got all the ideas from Faraday, but he just wrote down the math. Because Faraday invented the concept of fields. Now, Benjamin Franklin was the first person to realize that, charge, that there must be something called charging, it's like a fluid in be conserved. He was, he was another genius. Well, when Maxwell put together all of these things, and he left this out the first time, when he put this all together, he found out that this is a contradiction. There is, this is, there is, it's inconsistent. Conservation of charge was inconsistent with the known and powerful laws of electricity and magnetism. 
So he was fooling <coughs> around one day, and he uh, tried to add something which nobody had ever observed that would fix the equations. Can I patch them? It's like a bug in a program. Can I patch them so that they, so that they, that charges would be conserved? Well, he, after a little screwing around, he found that this did it. Okay? That might have been a footnote in history if it weren't for the next fact. So then he went around, he's kind of continued playing with the math, and he did the following sequence of operations. Now remember, he did not have vectors, so this would not fit on one page. This is 10 pages of derivation if he didn't have vectors. We have to write all the equations which are in, in, in coordinates. And that was a, a horrible mess in those days. <clears throat> vectors were invented by J. Wilmer Gibbs, I think, around the beginning of the 20th century. So, but what he figured out is he said that the curl of the curl of D had better be, well, from the previous page, uh, the curl of this, okay? Which he then realized he could commute those two terms, those two different types of derivatives. He then expanded the left hand side to get this, uh, substituted from the equation, he got the endogenous wave equation. Okay? Now, this is all, it, now it's not quite like this because I'm, now I've compressed it down, but what he, because he didn't have C. He had a, co a, com a combination of the permittivity of free space, which has to do with magnetic fields, and the dielectric constant. Okay? But he knew it produced a speed type, uh, type number. It had the units of speed. Okay? He then met, computed that, because everybody had measured the, for the dielectric constant of, uh, of free space and the permittivity for magnetic fields. He met, we computed it, and it turned out to be about 300 millimeters per second. Or well, those days, which probably in feet or something for all I know. For all before fortnight. And, uh, and it turned out that that was real close to the measured speed of light as determined by Romer having measured the motion of the satellites of Jupiter. <coughs> the timings of the satellites of Jupiter. I would have liked to have had that happen today. <laughs> that must have been one of those amazing experiences. And realized he would just discover that light was a electromagnetic phenomenon. Because the speeds came out the same. That would be a hard one to one since it wasn't true. Okay? So that's 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 why this is beauty, you see. And um, Einstein's field equations for gravity are similar, they're a little more complicated, and there are lots of indices, so they're tensors. But they're they're similar, and they have a very similar amazing feature. You say, I'm going to make my laws of mechanics independent of the weight of the state of motion of the, of the observer. Completely independent. It can, the observer can be accelerated. The observer, the observer can be moving in some complicated path. Okay? All of a sudden, you get gravity. And no free parameters. That's an amazing thing. And you, know, you compute the answer for the, for the motion of Mercury and discover, my gosh, the excess 43 arc seconds per century of the motion of the perihelion of Mercury is completely, completely accounted for by Einstein's discovery. Great things. Anyway, the reason I showed you this is because I wanted to show you this. Okay. Now, this is as close to the, uh, I, this is the, uh, the first page of it, but I wrote it down in a very general way. But we have been we have been programming with universal machines for about, as I said, 60 years. Universal machines are, are amazing because I can write an interpreter for any language in any other language with a universal machine. A universal language. So here I've written an interpreter for this language in itself, but of course what the language is depends upon what these these predicates are. In almost any other language I have written a similar, I could write, I could re just rename the syntax things here and have any other language I like. Well, with the exception of Prolog, I'm just like me. Okay, Prolog is not quite this common. There's another, there's another similar set of equations for Prolog. Okay. The important thing here is eval is defined in terms of apply 
and apply is defined in terms of the value. <coughs> okay? And through some ugly stuff that you don't want to know. There it is. That's all set. That's the whole thing. Okay. Well, what's important is this. Okay? That I have, <coughs> like magnetic and electric fields.
Now, I want to make it clear that this sounds like I'm talking about. I'm talking about engineering or physics or math. And I'm not. This is about everything. Suppose you're a poet. How do you make a poem? Well, I only know, I, I, poets tend to say things like, I have no idea. Okay. Um, but of course, if you actually watch a really good person building anything, what they do is the same stuff. They try to find little pieces. The pieces mean things. The mean, they, they have, have, for example, in poetry, you might have emotional content. You may want to paste it together, but it may not work exactly. It may be a book. You have to patch the bug. Or maybe if you're, you're about to shave off a piece of, a piece of metal in the machine shop. Yeah, you may have to do something like that. You may have to build purely an electric circuit. The electrical circuit was a filter. Between two stages, you might have to put an amplifier so you buffer the output of one stage to the next. That's a bug patch. Okay, but there are, there are all sorts of things like that. And every, every creative person is doing approximately, in my opinion, the same thing. I have some backing because Mr. Edgar Allan Poe uh, was telling, telling, he tells everybody about how he made the raven. There's a paper you should read. It's, it's on the web, you can get it. Okay. Uh, called Philosophy Composition. But I pulled out a, a little paragraph here where he points out that, that it's in fact very much like construction building a piece of, a piece of aesthetic, aesthetic structure. In fact, another fr a friend of mine, Mr. Boyd, uh, was, was perfectly happy to say that a work of art is a machine with an aesthetic purpose. Uh, its job is, is a particular aesthetic purpose and it's put together in terms of according to some, some structure. <coughs> So I'm going to end with a little story. I am programmed to run for 50 minutes. <laughs> Built in car park property of me from MIT. So we, uh, all classes start five minutes after every hour and end five minutes before the next. So people can walk for 10 minutes from class to class. <clears throat> Around 1980, that's a long time ago, uh, the personal computer revolution was just starting. And uh, there was a show in the Heinz Auditorium in, um, in, in Boston, Massachusetts, where people were displaying their wares. And uh, I went there. Like lot, lots of little kids uh, wanted to see the computers. And so uh, uh, it was nice because there were hard disk with 10 megabytes. It's only this big and cost only a few thousand dollars. <laughs> Actually, it's more than this big. <laughs> well, you could buy it. <laughs> That's amazing. <clears throat> so, so I, I, at one point I passed a little girl typing on a, on a uh, keyboard. She might have been nine years old. I looked like that. Very quickly typing in. Daddy was standing there looking at the ceiling. She grabbed onto his hand and said, Daddy, Daddy, this computer is very smart. It's basic and knows about recursive definitions. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think this is a true poem of the story. The concept of recursive definition didn't exist until about the 1930s. And the idea that you could test something to see if it understood it is a, is, is a real deep understanding of appreciation of the idea. That little girl was smarter than anybody else before 1930, at least on that fact, on that idea. By inventing computation, we made it possible for humans to be smarter because they can say more things. Because there are more distinctions that can be drawn, there are more, more expressions that can be made. And that's what I have to say for today. I'll take that.
first thing. And of course, that was ultimately done by Daniel Scott and uh, Strachey, where they showed that there was in fact a meaning to a set of recursion equations by building a continuous lattice interpretation of the logic. Okay? I could go through that if you wanted to do that. I'm not going to right now. The, um, it's a mathematical proof. But the, uh, the whole book's been written about that. That's the basis of what they call denotational semantics. But the, uh, the crucial thing is that, uh, that, now I lost your question. I'm sorry. What was the last part? The last part is, what, 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 is there a sort of computer science analog to the vacuum equation? The vacuum wave equation. The vacuum wave equation. Oh, the wave equation. Right. That fundamental insight that arises from the Maxwell equation. So you're not just saying something. Yes, I think there is. And I think I said it. It's that naming. Consistent naming is the issue. Okay? That, 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 that what you get out of the eval apply interpretive structure is just one way to do it. But you're, the underlying thing that you're getting, just like what you're getting out of, out of mass equations, is a gauge invariant field. Okay? What you're getting out of this is, uh, is a is name, name, alpha renaming invariant naming. How's that? Tomorrow on a completely different subject.